Hello and welcome to Watchbox Studios at the 1916 Company. This is Watches Tonight, and I'm your host, Tim Masso. This evening, we talk about the new Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean Boutique Specials, indulge in movement macros, both recorded and live. We chat live, and I answer your questions as we share viewer wrist shots live on Watches Tonight. Soma R, Enrique Cassiano, James W, staying up late in London. We got Matteo C, Dealer Ignition, Rick on Watches. We got John Goodman, Dave Abdul from the Black Forest in Germany. Pizza Man joining in from the American Midwest in Minnesota. Fernando from Florida, TLB, Rob Filmer from Chicago. Slow Boy Fuel Pump and Antelope 1013, among many others. If I didn't mention your name, I still love you. Okay, so this evening, guys, uh, if you enjoy this program, remember the fun continues afterwards on Tim Masso, the Instagram channel that you can literally binge watch with over 2,000 videos now live and north of 52,000 followers. First, lots to do. Second, I thank you. You guys made it happen. I'm still not verified, but if you know someone else named Tim Masso with access to those watches, that guy deserves to impersonate me. All right, viewer wrist shots number one. Owen H. and his Longa Odysseus lead our honor roll of friends to start the evening. Ben S. and Churro the dog mutually appreciate his Patek Philippe 5205R annual calendar moon phase. Mark S. wins the entire night. I mean, we could stop right here. With his breathtaking Vacheron Constantin Sputnik sculpture and wandering hour with a collection of Vacheron that will make your eye water. Do you see his four reference 2000 Vs behind? They made less than a hundred of those. Mark, you win. Michael V and his G-Shock 5600 up the ante nearly on the field at Super Bowl last night. And Yusef I won't be outdone sitting courtside with his Rolex Sprite at a Lakers game. Tac W and his AP Royal Oak Chronograph celebrate Chinese New Year in Manchester, UK's Chinatown. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. Brap Lab joining in from America's left coast in San Francisco. From the right coast, Jonathan R. from New Jersey. Rick on watches. We've got Thomas Burnett, Alexi Simola of Finland, Fernando I. What are your thoughts on the... AP 15407ST, rumors it will be discontinued. Well, I guess if that's the case and you're not already on the wait list and somewhere near the front, you're out of luck. Pre-owned, however, that's forever. Taking a quick look, we got John A. from Wales, UK, Arto Charles from New York, Vincent Lafoe staying up late in France, which I always appreciate, and Mason One joining us from the United Kingdom along with Stephen Robinson, who is specifically in Liverpool, the home port of the Titanic. And to be fair, a lot of other more distinguished vessels. All right, 2024 Omega Planet Ocean Boutique Edition. This is pretty good, guys. Inspired by Tudor and possibly aimed at Rolex, let's take a look. Let's start this evening with a familiar face because we discussed Tudor in my last episode and this taupe-toned AG925 in sterling silver occupied a place of honor. That is the Black Bay 58 in sterling silver. Well, consider that that 2021 debutante might be a delayed trendsetter if the Omega is any indicator. Its influential credentials undoubtedly include this new Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean Boutique Edition. Taupe is back, baby, but on a larger scale with somewhat warmer e-crew quasi-patina loom. But I really like the look of this, even if, frankly, Tudor got there first. To be fair, the Omega is about as different a dive watch as can be compared to the Tudor, but the basic tones and textures here, somewhere between gray and brown, unmistakable, and I have to say quite attractive in both cases. Now, all versions of the new Omega will be available through the company's factory stores, but only available through the company's factory stores. And to be fair, only one variant actually looks like a visual match tonally for that Black Bay 58. We have a few distinct dials and color-coordinated bezels from which to choose. One is the gray dial with sandblasted galvanic gunmetal treatment. That's the one you're looking at. I, I really do like those kind of cream tones. It's not a cloying type of fotina. This actually looks like it could just be a very attractive complementary color. Now another features a vertical satin silver base, a little bit like a Patek 5235G. 
And this one has green accents, along with tri-Arabic numerals and a matching green ceramic bezel insert. I really like that. This feels like Omega's attempt at a graceful exit from the waning green dial craze. Finally, we have a treatment described as sandblasted beige, which almost looks like a faint peach tone or lightly shaded pink. I'm not sure I buy that as a pure beige. There seems to be a little bit of a reddish undertone, but I do find it quite attractive, and it's a good match for the bezel and the strap. Each of these variants is satin finished across its entire exterior, and this is where I really appreciate the attention to detail. You can see that the dial furniture, like the logo, the hands, the indices, all of this has been beautifully and delicately satinated. Look at the faceting of the index at 11 o'clock. Really well done. This is a beautifully executed watch. Now we know because this is a mass-produced brand, these are mass-produced parts, but they are done with a wonderful eye for detail that you expect when you're paying this kind of money. And you might ask, what kind of money? Well, you're going to find out in a moment. All versions, technically speaking, have specs wildly at variance with that Tudor, including a display case back coaxial master chronometer, caliber 8900. So you can see it has a display case back with a little hippocampus or seahorse logo. And then you've got the typical arabesque Cote de Genève blackened screws. It's a good looking movement. 60 hours of power reserve, two barrels in series. It's got a nice flat torque curve and consistent torque to the escapement without having to rely on a remontoir, a differential, or a fusée. Uh, it's built to take a shock. It's also built to take a punch from magnets as it's virtually amagnetic, meets the COSC, but goes far beyond that in accuracy terms. And of course, the George Daniels coax remains borderline exotic for a watch under $50,000. How far under $50,000, you asked? I'm glad you did. Pricing is between $7,100 and $7,500, which seems reasonable, but keep this in mind, guys. We're not talking Rolex resale value. Basic Planet Ocean 43.5 millimeter pricing. You can see it's 6,700 on a strap. It has a habit of dropping 15 to 20% on secondary markets. So if you don't absolutely need to own one of these boutique specials on day one, consider waiting for the inevitable pre-owned and closeouts to hit Chrono 24. Okay, what is going on in the box? We have Watches Gallery from Nigeria. Thank you for staying up very late with me. We've got James Sharon saying, just got the notification, and I appreciate that you responded to it. <laughs> David Merrick from Middlesbrough, England, and I'm glad he's here. A Mick in Florida. John A. from Wales, UK. D. Mall. Patrick K. from Brooklyn. Mark S. joining in, a longtime follower of the show. He'll let me know if I've done good because... For better or for worse, Mark always has an opinion. And we've got Baltimore Spirits Co. joining in. Guys, welcome. It's good to have you with me. I am back from my trip to France. I went to the LV Watch Prize for Independent Creatives, and we gave Raoul Pages an award for his regulator with chronometer escapement, which frankly was the right call. There were five finalists. He was perhaps not the most accomplished, or even the most decorated, as Simone Brett came in riding a high from the GPHG, and Andrea Streller, while certainly skilled, seemed a little bit overqualified to be in that kind of a contest. Raul makes five to six watches a year out of basically his house, and the endowment, the marketing support, uh, the mentoring at Fabrique du Temps, and the business modeling that they provide over the next year is going to make a real difference. Raul Pages, remember that name. But I am back after 60 hours on the ground in France, and I've got viewer wrist shots from you. We're looking at viewer wrist shots number two. Franchi A sports a rare Roger Dubuis Easy Diver, a wash in the Dominican Republic. Lovely action shot of the watch as intended. JS prepares for the night shift with his IWC Top Gun Ceritanium 41 Pilot's Watch chronograph. Looking good as the shadows grow long. Chris C. doubles our IWC count with his Pilot's Watch chronograph, Top Gun Mojave Desert. Scott T. impresses with not one but two Bremont Kingsman Cinematic Special Editions. I did love that original Kingsman movie. I think that was an all-time great among modern action films. Abdul R. delights us with his new Felipe Pikulik. Sternen Himmel number 5 with custom purple dial. There's another name that should be on your radar. 
Send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. We got David Mulligan joining in from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the home of American Collectors Insurance, where I have my C5 Corvette insured. That's, that's what's in the background right there. We got Rooted Rotor Spooky Concepts, Ludwig, Luke Watson, Mr. Paradigm, tell us what you think about the Pot Tech Philippe 5712 on the chopping block, even though 2024 just gave it the new clasp. All I can say is there's always another Nautilus, so if you want that specific reference, either jump now or buy it pre-owned, but I would be shocked if there isn't eventually a 5812. Remember, the one you really want to own is the one you're only 3712. That's the Nautilus moon phase to buy. Mark S. Tim, how is the Lamagna 5100 too crude for Rolex? I don't think it is. I think it's just too commonly shared with others. There's nothing wrong with the Lamagna 5100. It can be certified chronometer. It's absolutely tough as a tank. It can be used to drive other complications. It's an odd combination of a column. Uh, it's a, I don't think it's a vertical clutch with a column wheel. It's, I think, a cam with a vertical clutch, which is really, really weird really weird, but it's a very tough movement. I think at the end of the day, it's just found in too many other movements in watches that are much less expensive, like Zinn, for example, or Fortis. And when the choice was between the 5100 and the El Primero in the late 80s, the choice was the El Primero, and I think they made the right choice. Amit K, Tim, any recommendations for a cream dial watch under 10K? I think you just saw one right there, but you could probably reach out to Armand Biard of Sartori Biard and ask for a cream dial and get exactly that because his watches are full custom. So highly recommended on that front. Eric Nielsen asking, Tim, why don't you use USAA to insure your collector car? Because American Collectors Insurance is the collector car affiliate of USAA. I get a discount for going through them and having USAA USA policy on my Chevy. Well, I guess I have two Chevys. So I've got my daily driver Chevy and the Corvette. USAA doesn't directly insure collector cars, so it's American collectors if you want to get the USAA rate on a collector car. Taddy, not all the best from Germany, Tim. Staying up late, which I always appreciate. Else in the box, let's see what's going on. Madi. Hi, Tim. Vacheron Corn 1955 or the Patek 5200 Gondolo 8 Days. My goodness, apples and oranges. Try them both on, because if you can just barely fit the Corn de Vache, you won't be able to fit the 5200. The 5200 is a big watch. Look at my video and see how it sits on my wrist. The lug-to-lug -lug dimension does not accurately describe how it sits. Those shaped watches are always too big. I would say go with the Corn de Vache unless you love a long power reserve and a calendar. If you love a chrono, it's the Corn de Vache. And of course, if you want steel, then the Corn de Vache is the only game in town. I really like Todinke's limited edition. That's one to look for, I think. We have all sorts of friends, and this chat box moves fast. Some guys ask a question, and then the chat box does this, and the question disappears so I don't get their name. Apologies, guys. Uh, Taddy Nut, Piaget Polo equals 222. No, I don't really think so. They hail from the same era, and the Polo was a much more luxurious watch in its day. Hard to believe, but it was. Back then, the Polo was considered to be upmarket compared to the Vacheron, and I believe the new model is so different in character that people would not realistically cross-shop them. What else is going on? LV, VC Overseas Generation 3 versus 5167 Aquanaut. Oh my God, Generation 3 Overseas all day long. Okay, guys, movement macros and details as good as it gets. This is what I love. Okay, the Omega was the clickbait, but now you get to see the substance of tonight's episode. I know that people watching this show don't want to hear endless news of mainstream watches constantly, so we're just going to skip the mainstream and get on with it. If you're in the crowd that weekly decries my mainstream topics in the common threads, Mark S., this segment is for you. And if we wind up with another underperforming show, because I again agreed to talk upscale niche watches, I blame you, Mark S. Okay, here we go. Debatune DBD, my endgame boss grail watch. The original, made in 39 pieces back in 2006. Rose gold, white gold, two different dial variants each. 
It was a weird tombstone-like machine with a jump hour, inline calendar, case back moon phase, and gold only case options. It had a Vendome lug and a conventional lug. It was a bizarre watch reflected in its sales volumes, but easy to wear. And unlike the DB28 Digital, I can actually fit this one on my wrist. I just can't fit it in my budget. As with most Debitoon watches, it was historically inspired because Denis Flageolet is a classicist, even if he doesn't seem that way all the time. And this was inspired by, among others, the 1928 Breguet pocket watch, number 1620, and Audemars Piguet, number 37696. Those are definitely the DBD's spirit animals. So consider my shock when Debitoon launched not one, but two re-editions of the DBD in 2023. That was the first of the two black and zirconium case burgundy dial, the season two, we had 13 pieces. This was inspired by the American recording artist Kasim Dean of New York, better known as Swiss Beats. And then the second re-edition was the Evergreen. Grade 5 titanium and 20 pieces. They're going to keep this model rare, and they'll be building those out until 2025, so don't expect any follow-ons anytime soon. At 120 grand and 20 pieces made, that watch right there is seriously exclusive. And I'm probably out of the running to own one from the word go, though I got a great shot of it on my wrist with a cuff that's colored to match. If I win the lottery here in the Keystone State, I can tell you that will be the first watch I buy. Okay. However, you can see what makes it so special, and a big part of the appeal to me is that it really is unlike anything else. A unique dial. Note here that we have Cote de Genève rather than Cote de Batoun. So you can see how the dark side of the stripe is more or less consistent across the dial. And the idea there is that it doesn't reverse from side to side, so it's not mirrored from side to side like Cote de Batoun would be. Now you can see all of the pivot jewels for the wheels are on the dial. They are integral with the dial. The dial is part of the movement, and the attention to detail is superb with steps for the apertures and faceting for the nameplate. Uh, evergreen, looking good, a very versatile green that I think is going to go the distance in an era when a lot of greens probably won't. All the usual Debatoon tech hides backside. This is basically the dial side of a DB28, albeit on the back of the watch. So if you love Debatoon tech, but you don't want it up front, Front, this watch is for you. Take a look. Now here we do have those Cote de Batoon, and you can see how the dark crests reverse from side to side. And then you can also see there's a black polished steel bridge for the parachute shock protection that gives way to fired blue steel springs at the bottom. There's a black polished cap over the base plate. We've got two barrels, five days of power reserve. You cannot accidentally overwind it. Look at the knurled crown, which is micro drilled. And the attention to detail here is everywhere. You can see that we have a balance wheel, but more on that in a moment, that also includes fire bluing. Let's start with these features. First, the barrels. Two of them in series, super flat torque curves, so no constant force device is really necessary to maintain constant amplitude. One of them has a mainspring that slips like an automatic, so if you overwind it in your zealous quest to meet the full five-day power reserve, you cannot break it. Everyone who's making an expensive manual wind watch should do this. The barrels have satinated ratchet wheels, but note the snailing on the barrel cap below the ratchet wheels. It's a beautiful hand-laid spiral that's done manually against a milling wheel. You can also see just how deeply grooved and gradiated those Cote de Batoon are. There's a wonderful shading across them. And then look at the beveling at the edge of the bridge. That is world class. That is as broad and beautiful as Ferrier, Gautier, Lang Untaina, and Grubel Forsey. I would even go so far as to say it's better than what you'll find on the Grubel Forsey sports watches. The hairspring patented like the mainspring barrels. You could see there's a micro clamp. These two pieces of hairspring are bent by hand at Debatoon to match their patented profile. Now it's thin like a flat hairspring and shock resistant like a flat hairspring, but because of the uneven distribution of material all the way around 360 degrees, it actually has perfectly balanced mass from edge to edge to edge, which means it breathes concentrically like an overcoil without the compromises of an overcoil. 
Let's take a look at the shock protection now. You could see that enormous black polished and blued steel bridge over the center, which is both functional and artisanal. And you could see that there is a spring on each side of the balance bridge. So you have Inca block over the balance staff pivot, but then on each side you have another spring. Now it's got two functions. One, avoid damage to the balance staff pivot, obviously. This has been used in pro athletics. We have yet to break it. Second, and by when I say we, I mean my company has the majority stake in Dibitoon, and we've actually given these watches to tennis players. We have yet to break this movement. Now, it's also chronometric because with three springs cushioning the blow, you're more accurately and quickly able to recenter the balance staff pivot in its pivot jewel. So it also has a chronometric function. You can also see the parachute when we get close to it is beautifully done. Take a look at the combination of beveling, Cote de Genève, media blasting, and black polish on both the balance bridge and the spring itself. And the spring in steel is fired in a kiln. Look at that steel bridge for the balance and how beautifully executed it is, completely rounded and black polished at the lower left hand corner, a la Grubel Forsy, and then the specular finish on the bridge itself, including black polished locating pins to place it on the bridge. You can even see that the jewel sinks have been reamed and polished. Take a look at the balance wheel. As good as it gets, that is the 10th balance wheel patented by Debatoon founder and watchmaking lead Denis Flageolet. Maximizing the mass in the rim, the wheel is fired titanium, the masses are white gold. It reduces the effect of thermal variation on timing while also maximizing the mass in the rim and via the bulb profile and recessed masses, minimizing the effects of parasitic aerodynamic drag. Okay, that is fun stuff. David M saying, I'll play tennis if you give me a DB. You can actually get this sensorial watch that DB makes now and beat it as badly as you want. And based on the data it gathers and its microprocessors and memories, Denny will then build a fully mechanical DB28 Grand Sport for you, built to your specs and requirements. So if you want to shoot pool, fire guns, play tennis, or play 18 holes, guess what? We have a Debatoon for you. We have Free G joining in from Nassau, Bahamas. Mark S. Tim, any chances Rolex picked the El Primero over the 1185 because they insisted on a 4 hertz beat rate and it's easier to detune than to make the 1185 tick faster? I think it's more likely that they picked the El Primero because the Daytona is a sports watch and the 1185 was likely to break in situations where the El Primero wasn't. I am certain Rolex tested every candidate movement and found the 1185 to live up to its reputation as fine but not a sports watch caliber. Justin D, hey Tim, what are your thoughts on the Blanc Pas Le Mans series? Any faves? Yeah, all of the A toute vitesse models. Look them up. They were specials for a Chicago era dealer and there were several of them. But the Le Mans A toute vitesse, absolutely bonkers and beautiful. Possibly the best limited edition of the 2000s. Okay, jumping back, Laurent Ferrier, the classic micro rotor. This used to be known as the Galet micro rotor. This was their second product after the original Tourbillon. And it's the same wonderful watch as before, even though the nomenclature has changed. Steel case, 40 millimeters, 5N rose gold toned autumn dial with vertical satination. White gold hands, assegai or spear shaped, so are the indices, white gold polished. We have a wonderful and exquisite set of dial textures, which you can see right there. And then we have Caliber FBN 22901, a collaborative effort between Fabrique du Temp and Christian Ferrier and Laurent Ferrier. Fabrique du Temp, of course, the ones who gave the endowment to Raoul Page at the awards ceremony that I just attended. And I was a judge and I was happy to see Page win. He's going to be working with the best alongside Enrico Barbasini and Michel Navas at Fabrique du Temps, who were the co-designers of this movement. Has a 22 karat guilloche rotor with a jeweled staff and a micro rotor. You can see the jeweled staff at center and then if you look carefully you can see the micro ratcheting system that makes this the most silent and the smoothest automatic winding system I've ever, ever encountered. Bevels are broad and mirrored. Look at that inward angle over the center wheel. It is sharp and creased. These bevels are finished by hand and gorgeously so. This is what you get when mass production is no 
consideration and no object. You can also see here we have I would say possibly even better Cote de Genève execution than on the Debitune. Certainly they're broader and I think they have a greater shading gradient. You can also look at how perfectly polished the balance cock is. That is a steel component, not easy to finish, mirrored on its top, skeletonized on its interior, and look at those inward creases. There are a lot of very high-end watches that have those tiny skeletonized balance cocks and they do not inwardly crease the four angles formed. Here, all four angles are creased and perfect with internal beveling executed. Wheel spokes on the fourth wheel. Take a look at this. This is hidden under the train bridge, but they're internally beveled to a Grubel-like level of shine and sharpness. You don't get this standard on a basic Patek AP Vacheron or even Langa. Look at how well that's done and how they manage to get sharpness of the angles an even application of bevels, despite the fact that the interior portions of that wheel are absolutely minuscule. And this is in a place where few people will even look. That is a sign of integrity. A doge might even say, so much, well, you know, wow. There is no Swiss lever on this Ferrier because it uses a double direct impulse escapement system inspired by Breguet's famous Echappement Naturel of 1802, and maybe we can go full screen on that because it's a little bit small and it does help to have a bigger picture. A nickel phosphorus like a formed wheel. You can see they have these little tiny crenellated towers. Uh, those things are actually the impulsing posts. They directly impulse the roller jewel on the on the roller table of the balance wheel. So there is no Swiss lever. There are two of these wheels and the balance bounces back and forth two directions. So there are two of these wheels. They impulse the balance tangentially and only in its direction of travel. The idea is it creates a little friction, improves power reserves. So you get three days despite one small barrel and it improves precision and it's unlubricated, so it reduces maintenance requirements. We also have small details like this winding rocker that are polished on their top and chamfered on their tiny small surfaces. Look how those bevels come to a point at the top. That is a winding rocker. It engages and disengages the winding system as you wind manually. And look at the recesses at the edges of the bridges, which feature the same attention to detail. Once again, those stripes are superb. You can see the locating pegs that help to place the bridge on the base plate below. But look at the polish of the steel bridge for the rotor and look at how the edges of that bridge merge with the bridge of the rotor and there are those tiny little bevels in between the crevices. On a lot of movements like Jorn, like Moser, uh, mainstream independent brand watches, you would find that those little hollows on the bridge would not be micro beveled, but here they are. You can even see that the screws are nicely slotted internally. Outstanding. Laurent Ferrier, the best kept secret in high horology, and there's great pre-owned inventory, not just from us, all over the internet. Go out, buy a good one with full box and papers, and be glad you did, because someday, something's going to happen with that brand. The watches are too good for nobody to notice. I think they literally are pretty darn close to like a Long Untaina, a Grubel, a Top End Debitun, a Ferdinand Bertou level. They're that good. When you're talking about the Galley Micro Rotor or the Classic Micro Rotor and the Double Hairspring Tourbillon, someday we'll wish we bought two, one for the wrist and one for the investment portfolio. Okay, Vincent Lafoe. Is the natural escapement less reliable than the Swiss lever? In 1802 it was, today it is not. If you're looking at Jorn, if you're looking at Ferrier, if you were looking at Kerry Voudelainen with the Von Wiet, if you were looking at Charles Frodsham, all of the initial errors that were present in the Breguet models have been overcome by advanced manufacturing, design, new fabrication methods, and just the qualitative standards inherent in modern watches, as well as different drive systems often than what Breguet used. Mark asked Tim, is Valju in-house for anyone, like how Lemania is in-house for Breguet? No, it, it was subsumed like Unitas and a million others into ETA. What else is going on? What are your thoughts on the new LV Tambor? A good watch, but the best version is the one you can't buy yet. I saw it it's a prototype Jean Arnaud's wearing right now. He showed it to me in July when it was brand new. He showed it to me again last week and he showed me that they're really noting all of the things that are not wearing well, where you have a combination of tantalum and steel in the bracelet links, which tells me they're paying a lot of attention to that prototype 
and it's not just a novelty for the boss. I think that will come to market eventually. I just don't think it's coming soon enough. That's the one I would wait for, but I do think it's a very nice watch. The problem is the Tambor is a nice watch that plays in a very crowded segment. I think it would probably be like my third choice or my fourth choice after the LV Sport or the Laurent Ferrier Sport Auto, the Moser Streamliner Center Second, and the Vacheron 5100 or 4500 V, pardon me. It uses the caliber 5100. What else is going? Eduardo saying, Laurent Ferrier is my pick for a dress watch if I ever have a use case for that. Brent Wilson, what's up, Tim? What's the chances of a titanium Submariner? Low. I'd be very shocked if that happened. I don't think it's impossible to think that there might someday be a Submariner that combines platinum and titanium. That could happen. I don't know. They'd have to come up with a new word for that, because Rolex has an alloy-sounding name like Rolosaur or Rolesium for materials that are merely assembled together rather than alloyed. Okay, now, let's take a look, because I've got wrist shots number three. Rayon H stuns with the IWC Pilot's Watch Automatic 41 U.S. Navy Black Aces on the flight deck of an Airbus A320, where he is senior first officer. Vic A and his Rolex Starbucks enjoy the view and snacks in Rosemary Beach, Florida. We have Roy S., who braves winter in the Sierra Nevadas of America with his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. The watch is out of season, but never out of style. Matt P. and his green Rolex sub appreciate the weather on the big island of Hawaii. Speaking of being in season, Nathaniel K. of South Florida delights us with his rare and fine Daniel Rolt Athies II. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. And I guess I can't use that for much longer because we are becoming the 1916 company across the board very soon. Okay, let's talk about watches. We saw macros, now macros live on watches tonight. So here we have the legendary Alangu Unzena Zeitwerk, but this is the striking. You get a double strike at the flip of the hour. Let me see if I can capture this using my lav and my macro camera. All right. Let me try to put this lav back on. Not easy to do without a mirror. Okay, so the Zeitwerk Striking came out two years after the original in 2011. It's bigger. It's 44.2 millimeters. This one's still white gold. The dial is a combination of sterling silver. What's black is sterling silver. Uh, this central component is actually part of the movement. It is made of German silver, but it's rhodium plated to create a more natural white, silver, and black contrast on the dial. Now, what you're looking at is a digital timekeeping watch, and the fun part is you can actually play with the quick set if you want to set it forward and backwards so you get instant gratification. You can also operate the strikers if you want automatically just by activating and deactivating them. Now flipping everything over, I know, I know, I know, I know, you want to see that again. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Oh my gosh, I love that. Now flipping everything over, this is the still this is still the caliber L043. This is not the second generation with twin barrels. Uh, this is the original with the Maltese cross stopworks. That was lost on the second generation Zeitwerk in 2019, and I really miss this. Uh, this is actually designed to prevent you from overwinding the watch rather than to prevent it from getting below a certain level, though it does that too. Now there is a remontoir system, and you can see it's a very expansive remontoir system. Because the mainspring is so powerful it would cause knocking and overdriving of the escapement and the balance. This system prevents the barrel from driving it directly and so there are two third wheels with a hairspring between them. It gets topped off once every minute and thus the escapement achieves relatively constant force and constant amplitude and the array of colors and finishes and textures and tones here is surpassing. As good as you'll find anywhere in the world. Maybe you want to see how this looks from the back when it jumps. It doesn't look like much, but there's actually an air brake that slows everything down right there. 
Okay, now we're gonna stick with longa, and I'll let you decide which of the two longa movements here is the best. This is the 1815 Retropont Perpetual Calendar. It's a big watch, 41.9 rose gold, came out in 2013. You've got a power reserve indicator, perpetual calendar, moon phase, and then flip it all over caliber 101, a big movement with two column wheels. You can see one, two. That's because it's got a split second mechanism that allows you to split the seconds. You can see that everything that's silver here is steel. Everything that's that sort of uh, pale gold is what's known as German silver, which is actually a nickel, copper, zinc alloy, where the copper gives it that golden hue. There's excellent depth here, and this is really East German watchmaking at its best in the modern era. You get one, two freehand engraved structures, and so a lot of people say on the basis of watches like this that Langa has surpassed Patek, but let me show you a watch that would sort of dispute that notion. This came out in 2022. It's an update of a model that debuted in 2012. Patek Philippe 5204G. This was the first version of the 5204, a split second chronograph perpetual calendar. And so what we've actually got here is a split with a coaxial pusher in the crown. We've got a lot of loom, which in my opinion makes it more appealing than the longer for everyday use. White metal case, we've got an olive green metallic gradient dial, and then we've also got the moon phase. We've got a case here that's got lovely stepped case flanks and welded lugs, and then it's 40 millimeters in diameter. It's a lot more compact than the longa. When you turn it over, you can see there is no loss in quality. This movement arguably has even better depth and close detail work than you'll find on the Longa. Certainly it doesn't have the large, flat, unadorned expanses of bridge that you have on the Longa. I feel like millimeter for millimeter, there's better use of space back here, and it has a significantly longer power reserve than the 45 hour Longa. This is actually 65. You have a capped column wheel in traditional Geneva fashion, which I always love to see. And then I just think this watch is more wearable on a daily basis, even if perhaps from a bells and whistles standpoint, it doesn't quite stand out like the Longa but of the two, this is the one I'd rather wear. Now jumping back to the Fatherland, this is a watch you don't see much. It came out in 2022, it was a platinum limited edition of 150 pieces, 42 millimeters in diameter. This is the Panamatic calendar. This was Glasuta Original's first ever annual calendar. So one adjustment each year during the jump from February to March. You have the Panorama Datum, double digit date. There's a little month of the year indicator right next to it. There's a double quick set for each and then a moon phase. Flip it all over, you have the spectacular nickel anthracite coated caliber 9210. It's like the caliber 90 got a bunch of upgrades from the uh, caliber 39. So power reserve is now 100 hours. We now have a silicon hairspring. It's now free sprung. Spectacular solarization of the reduction wheel for the winding system. The bridges with lovely streifen, as I am told they are called. We have a double swan's neck. It's actually called a duplex swan's neck. Let me vary the angle a little bit here. And you could see that we have this a spectacular freehand engraved duplex bridge or a single balance bridge, we could call it below the duplex swan's neck. And let me see if I can get that angle again. That's really its best angle where you can really just see the depth. There you go. Where you can really see the depth, the floral engraving of that balance bridge. 150 pieces, absolutely stunning. And a very modern watch that even includes a little bit of loom on the dial side. Full platinum with a distinctive case band. I don't think my camera's gonna, oh, my camera did pick it up. There you go, with a lovely stepped lugs. Okay, now watches are not all about case backs. Some watches have incredible dials. And Long approved that in 2018 when they launched the Saxonia Thin Copper Blue. So you have a precious metal dial base on top of which there is a very dark aventurine glass, which is a vitreous, that is glass-based translucent enamel. And then it has all of these metallic deposits that are visible through the translucent enamel, creating the appearance of a bottomless space or cosmos, as if I'm looking up into space. Now it's 39 millimeters in white gold. It lives up to its name at only 6.4 millimeters thick. And then on the case back, impressively, a 72 hour power reserve here. This is one longer you can wear dial up in good conscience. I don't really feel like the movement overshadows the dial here because the dial is so potent. My favorite feature, aside from the fact that it gives you everything you expect on the longer movement, the solarization of crown wheel and ratchet wheel is really quite surpassing. Now another watch that's all about the dial 
is this Debatoon DB25 Moon Phase Starry Sky. Now we have a solid titanium dial that is fired blue in a kiln. It's mirror polished. We have a spherical moon phase of blued steel and white palladium. And what's really fun here is that this, let me see if I can get it, has a quick set so you can set that spherical moon phase, which includes 44 blue sapphires and 44 brilliant cut diamonds. We've got brilliant cut diamonds forming the constellation Orion, the other celestial bodies, the distant stars, or white gold cabochon. And then in profile, we have an insert of 61 baguette diamonds in a 40 millimeter white gold case. I feel bad because I don't have a polishing cloth, but the entire case back is black polished steel, mirrored, beveled, polished across its top with a diamond paste. We've got a solid disc of silicon with a white gold rim. Again, one of Denis' patented balance wheels. This was the 2010 patent balance. Sean, an absolute hero and a legend coming in with the save and a polishing cloth so I can show you how perfectly mirrored this case back is. Most high-end watches will give you some mirrored screws, maybe a swan's neck fine adjustment. Here, Debatoon does the entire freaking movement, including the rounded bridge. Twin barrels snailed and solarized against six hours of power, or six days of power reserve. So you got your 144 hours there. And a watch that in 40 millimeters is actually quite wearable, discreet, and one of the best uses of gems I've ever seen on a men's watch. Debatoon should be known for its dials because it makes them in-house just like it does its cases and movements. This was actually a piece made in only about three dozen copies since 2014. 44 millimeters in rose gold and only 10.1 millimeters thick. The DB25 Midnight Blue. The center of the dial is fired titanium again. We've got rose gold Breguet hands, but the outer dial is made of fired Grand Faux enamel with blued indices and Brege Arabic numerals. So we have enamel flanking titanium with rose gold hands at center. And this one is automatic winding with a shock protection system on the winding rotor. And, and we also have shock protection, still triple parachute for the balance staff. So somehow this dress watch winds up being tough as a Richard meal. You have this combination of media blast and satination over the bridge to give it more of an industrial chic aesthetic. But technically speaking, it's the same shock protection, chronometry, and six day power reserve as the manual you just saw. Okay. Now, if you want to talk dials, this is one of Patek's best in recent years. Came out in 2019, the 5212A weekly calendar. So it has a font, including on the date disc, that was mocked up using handwriting during the prototyping phase. And everyone wound up liking this employee's handwriting so much that Patek opted to make this 40 millimeter steel calendar watch with that typeface, the original handwriting on the production model. Now we've got the day of the week, we've We've got the date, we've got the week of the year, and then the month corresponding roughly to the week. And yes, there are some years with a 53rd week, so people ask, it is correct. This watch features a lovely case. I don't know how, uh, come on camera, come on. Yeah, there we go. With beautiful fluted lugs and super sharp breaks between lug flank and case. And then on the back, we've got the latest Patek in-house caliber, accurate to minus three plus two seconds a day. It speaks to the level of quality you get on even a basic center rotor Patek automatic that it looks this good and at a distance. The macro, if we got really close, would even be more flattering. And finally, because I like to smile, and I'm not sure how you distinguish between the dial and the movement here, we have Max Booster's HM10 Bulldog, which came out in titanium and rose gold for 2020. We have two aluminum hemispheres or domes in blue that display the time, and it's a scrolling time. We also have a movement created by Simone Brett back before he was famous. And yes, this is a Simone Brett construction here. It's like the split escapement on the Legacy machine where you have the escapement, the angle and the wheel on the dial side, a 14 millimeter free sprung balance beaten at a stately 18K, an overcoil hairspring, this enormous and vaulted black polished steel balance bridge, 
and then a nickel anthracite base below. And yeah, there's a lot of loom. You can see it's designed to look like a bulldog a little bit, the HM10 Bulldog. And it says on the back, forget the dog, beware of the owner. As with all MBNF in-house calibers, this one features eye-watering finish, a nickel anthracite aesthetic. We have beveling, black polishing, solarization on the ratchet wheel, and stripes of exceptional quality. There's even a little set of jaws right here. I don't know how well we can capture that. But when the jaws are closed, the watch is effectively out of energy. When the jaws are open, it is fully energized and the bulldog is poised to pounce. Guys, thank you for joining me. This was an absolute epic, but we're not done tonight. Viewer wrist shots number four, Gary S. from Scottsdale, sports a blue Nubuck croc strap on his Panerai Luminor PAM 1313 that does change the look of the watch a lot more adult and refined. Dr. Warren P. is in Richmond, Virginia with his refined Panerai Rajamir. Brian M shares a Breguet 3040 triple calendar serpentine that he recently bought from the 1916 company. Thank you, Brian, for trusting our company. Eric O and his Rolex Daytona ride out the rain in Napa, California, and Taylor U drives us home with his Torsti Lina Galitas and Camaro SS1LE in Rally Green. Thanks to Sean and Nick, who's actually under instruction tonight, learning the ropes on the switcher. It was seamless. You guys did a great job, especially you, Nick. And Sean, thank Thank you for that polishing cloth at just the right time. To all of you who joined, thank you so much. You make the best job in the world possible. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.